inga mana, inga reo, inga kālangalanga maha, ngā whanukato, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Te tuatahi e mihi ana ki ngā whanau e huatu nei, e nei, ngā paki waitara o ngā kōrero o, o tūpuna i huatu nei mai tata hoki ki te mate ngā rātou. Nā reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. We met recently eight families who had the opportunity to tell digital stories about their experience of their family nearing the end of life. In that whole process, we met at the University of Auckland where they had an opportunity to tell it digitally. I just want to add that we want to express our thanks to them for sharing their stories. And these stories are to be used to support professional health workers with regard to caring for those nearing the end of life. At the end of each video uh, commentary, Dr. Tess Moeke Maxwell and Stella Black will give uh, some comments and brief with regard to each story, and uh, that will support uh, and aid the aim of the, the whole kaupapa. Nā rere kanui tēnei o tātou kōrero, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou ki ora hui mai tātou. When am I going back to Tapu? Mama, you would ask when we brought you back to Auckland. Damn, that little shadow on the top right corner of your lung. Eight years on from first monitoring you, I had prayed it would not change. But change it did. And the more I lived knowing that every day above this earth with you is a blessing. Your gentle smile ever present, your soft voice of apology, Sorry for coughing so much. If you could reach for your cigarettes, you would have. If you could reach for your lager, you would have. I reach over to hug you. Oe kōtero, thank you very much. It's all right, Mama. We'll look after you. Mama, do you remember how you practically fell out of bed in a hurry to get dressed the minute we mentioned would take you to Tapu? I rode in the van with you to Thames, you like a matriarch propped high on your bed, beaming as you comment on the changing landscape. You ate your heart out at KFC like you hadn't eaten in years. You greeted the locals like you'd never left. When we took you for a walk through the town centre, I gazed back to check up on you, and there you were in your wheelchair, smoking. Head cocked cheekily to one side, chin raised high as you blew the smoke away. Like a movie star, you changed cars. There you were riding in the Saab convertible, your pink scarf holding my hat on your head. No illness could take away the joy on your face that day. Two days later you left us. Like we all set you in the Tapu Hotel where you had your last lager. Cheers, Mama. What a hell of a ride you've given us all. So Tess, what I think this story illustrates well is the importance of um, the ancestral home or the Turanga Waiwai. What do you think? Oh, kia ora Stella. I think that um, often Māori have multiple homes 
and sometimes when we approach end of life we want to return to those homes it settles our uh, wairua and helps us to pass over as well and uh, Ancestral homes, yes, uh, but also Tūranga Waiwai, uh, places that mean something special to mm. us, landscapes or uh, significant places we have visited, as in the case of Eliza's mama. And uh, when they took her back there, they knew that it would really uplift her mana, and so they were bringing this joy to her before she passed away. So what does the story point to that you think might be really helpful for health professionals, Tess? Good question. I think that health professionals could keep in mind that visiting our ancestral homes and Tūranga Waiwai before we die uh, and on the illness trajectory is really important for us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might disappear and a health professional might think, where have they gone? And we've returned home. And sometimes we might be gone for short or longer periods of time. And uh, also somebody might turn up unexpectedly in the rohe or the district where the health professionals working. Once again, it's to be mindful and respectful that people are visiting their ancestors, i.e. the landscapes, significant places, and also renewing and rekindling the relationships with uh, those people they love and that are dear to them, as in the case of Eliza's uh, mama, been taken back to Tapu to visit the people there, um, but also the Fano that uh, live in those ancestral homes, it's good to connect with them too. It just prepares the way to her for the journey home. In November 1977, I receive a phone call in Australia that our mother is quite ill. So I return. I am shocked. Mum's diagnosis, pancreatic cancer. Our eldest sister Rachel and I become mum's main carers. Dad attends to mum's morning routine of washing and freshening up for the day. Cancer took its toll on our mother's body. It killed me that she, who had fed the whole village, was now being deprived of food. We grew up on a dairy farm up north with animals, gardens and fruit trees where immediate and extended whānau cared for each other. Trips to the beach were not to swim, but to gather kaimona, which we would share, a kete here or a bucket there, and then perhaps just a bowl for Granny Maku, who lives alone. Now, barely able to eat, my mother still longed for the taste of familiar kai, she would ask for kōrori, a Māori porridge-like white sauce. As kids, it was our special breakfast. But to my frustration, I could never get the consistency right. It was either lumpy or it would split. Another day, Mum was hungry for crayfish. Because crayfish was too expensive, I bought a handful of prawns. We sat in the car and I offered one to her. I asked her, does it taste right? And she said yes. I share an entry from my journal on a day when mum's pains were severe. Five days before she died, she said, get everything ready because our home would be full of people on Monday. Mum closed her eyes to this world on Monday, 17 September 1979 at 10am, surrounded by family. For her tangi, we emptied the kitchen shelves, preserved peaches, pears, pickles, chutneys, jam, meat from the freezer, potatoes, pumpkins and vegetables from the garden. Once again, my mother provided for everyone. Hey, piriti 
きてらにえはいれはいれらえてファイアはいれらわいほあきむりねえめいおてぴゃいとてなんなえ Hey, pity, tiki, terangi. So, Tess, what do you think we can learn from Fire Kitty Pie's story? Well, feeding someone when they're unwell is a very,、um, I think, sacred ritual, and it involves kairangatira, or、uh, food for the esteemed. And in terms of caregiving, this is a particular role that some people in a whanau hold. And in this story, it was Fire Kitty Pie's right to hold that. And food for the esteem、uh, is usually、uh, anything from seafood to、uh, the particular porridge that she's talking about there, or it could be、uh, rotten corn, mutton bird, anything like that. But also, it's a story about grief because Fire Kitty Pie talked about how. She、um, really felt the pain of her mother not being able to enjoy these、uh, beautiful foods that she herself had given the community. And so I think it also highlights that grieving happens throughout the、uh, illness to death journey and not just when someone dies. So, what do you think health professionals can learn from this story? Well, I think health professionals can、uh, learn that we、uh, and appreciate that we enjoy. Kairangatira,、um, that it's important to uplift the Maori of a person when they're unwell. It might not be a huge meal, it might just be a little taste,、um, but these foods are associated with memories of our past, our ancestors, our lands, and our families. And、um, being、uh, compassionate and understanding、uh, about our need to have these foods in a hospital setting or a hospice setting or any other place where we might need. Care、uh, of health professionals、um, is an important contribution they could make to making Fano feel safe and secure. She was our Christmas tree, the red, blossoming Pahutakawa that lit up our house with her smile. That's my mother in law I'm talking about, which is why when I first met my wife, I quickly realised I wasn't just caught in her. But also my future mother in law. So when mum got dementia, it was a no brainer that she moved in with us. Shower, breakfast, toast burning, clothes ironed, prepping myself for work. Rush, rush, rush. Every morning, but just before I head out, I stop to say, Morning, mum. See you later. And every day, Despite the night she had had, despite the pain, she always greeted me with a smile. A smile that slowed everything down for a moment, a split second, a moment in which I could breathe and let go. She lit up all our lives my children, bouncing around her bed, standing on her slippers, always making her laugh. People think of caregiving as a burden. Really? We thought it was a privilege looking after Mum. The bottle of lime red we've kept since your passing takes centre stage when we come together, always reminding us, taking us to that place, welling up balls of emotion as we laugh, cry, and sing. Still our matriarch, still the bright, shining star that lights up our lives. We all know we are the lucky ones.
And now mahi tis, we don't often hear the tāne or the male perspectives and the whānau caregiving stories. What did you think about Red's story? Oh, I thought it was awesome and I think it was really cool that we had a, a male speaking about his caring relationship. And um, I think men do do a lot to care, we just perhaps don't always hear about it. And often uh, we hear that our tāne uh, take charge of karakia and um, they'll take a leadership role in organising things and whatnot. But in Red's case, like many of our men, he washed dishes, he cleaned the kids, and he supported his partner to provide that frontline care. And that is so important because somebody has to be standing there and, you know, helping to run the whānau at that time. And I think the other thing that's really awesome about his story is that um, Red never pathologises uh, his mother-in-law. He never talks about her dementia as a problem or he, he doesn't identify her with that at all. He adores her and she adores him and that's the story that he wants us to know and I think that's amazing. Yeah, that's true, I agree. He and the whānau all showed um, a lot of aroha and respect for her. Um, would you say that's key in this story? I think we can all learn something from that. Uh, look, look to the person and uh, treat the person as a person and not as their illness. Yes, kia ora. I shared a special bond with Mum. From the day I was born, she said, Mum whāngai me from her oldest daughter. Growing up, my brothers and sisters and cousins around me would get hidings, not me. They would have to do chores. Not me. Yep, spoilt. I adored Mum. Young at heart, life of the party, contagious laugh and smile that would light up the room. Loved a few beers and her Paul Mall filter. Showing her strength, she outlived two husbands and all of her three siblings. Diabetes, heart problems, failing kidneys, for years we battled it together. No more running down the road for a pie. She had to have my scrambled eggs instead. I policed her pills, fizzy drinks, cigarettes. But nothing prepared me for the final blow, dementia. Would mum really not know who I am? Continually forgetful, mum moves in with us. One day, she calls me into her room and asks me for a kiss. I hold her hand and lean over to kiss her. My eyes tearful, fearful. She places her ring in my hand. Her now bony fingers can't contain her greenstone ring anymore. I slip it onto my finger. No words spoken, none needed. Mum's favourite place to sit was under the peach tree on her green seat. Now empty, but I see her there, picking up peaches, laughing, raising a glass and I tugging at her skirt always close, always knowing this was special. So I think what this story highlights for me is that close relationships can really sustain whānau who are doing the caregiving when it takes years or months and through all the different transition points. What did you think Tess? I think Jolene's story is a really good example of that. Um, as Māori we often have uh, multiple and complex health issues and these can compound and so you're correct Jolene does talk about the longevity of uh, care that she provided to her uh, mum. And I think it requires deep, deep aroha. Uh, that's the level that you have to go to to sustain you over all of those years. 
And what's interesting in her story is she has this wonderful narrative about her mum sitting under the peach tree. You know, her mum's gone now, but she imagines her sitting under the peach tree on her chair eating a peach. And I think that emphasises the way in which we love. Those bonds are never lost. Uh, the loved ones are never forgotten. And her mum still continues to play a great role in her life. So what can health professionals learn from the story? I think, you know, one of the things they can learn is that we come in all shapes and sizes as Vano, and um, that providing um, compassionate support and care will help to sustain us over the months and years that we provide care. So, you know, getting alongside us and really helping with health literacy and supporting people to do the hard work is what's important. I was 14 when Mum died of cancer. Dad was heartbroken and never remarried. I worried for him. Dad played as hard as he worked. Years of drinking, smoking, sports and work injuries left his tinana worse for wear. Multiple trips to the hospital. Each time we gathered, embraced ourselves. But he improved and we could breathe again. My younger brother BJ in Rafati and I in Auckland, both keen to have Dad move in with us. Whatever you think, Dad said. Still, I worried for him. My tuakana, who had lost her husband suddenly, counselled me. Don't have any regrets. Make sure you can live with any decision about Dad's care after he dies. For a while, Dad had a purpose. He looked after Courtney and Maya, and he loved it. Eventually, the hospital visits increased and his stays there became longer. It drove him nuts. He discharged himself, refusing to go back. We had a big raru raru. I cried. I wanted him to get the best treatment. I wanted to do the right thing. I wanted Dad to maintain his mana, but... Nightly shifts lifting him up, taking him to the toilet every half an hour. He was cold, then he was hot, he couldn't sleep. Everything was a hoha. Dad passed away on a sunny Friday afternoon. I lay with Dad, overwhelmed with exhaustion and grief. His last breath became my first. No need to worry anymore. Stella, as this is your story, what aspects of your story would you like to share with us? Kia ora, Tess. So I think with Dad's story, the biggest thing was that his chronic illness spanned many years and months. Mm. Um, but through that journey, we found that aroha superseded everything. Mm. Um, and so what, did we, what we wanted to do was to ensure that we were always maintaining his mana especially given he had such a strong personality. So we as the whānau kind of did everything we could to keep everything normal. Mm. Um, he took a really important role in looking after the mokopuna. Mm. He was vital to his own health care and his decisions. 
and we allowed him to do that. What do you think health professionals can take from this story? Patience and understanding by the health professionals. A smile goes a long way, a hearing ear, not only for the patient but also for the whānau. Just having that, that aroha and that openness to be able to talk. We used to go fishing in the fish shop. We come from the seaside in Whangaroa, where we were used to having kaimuana, but living in the city, our only option was to fish in the fish shop. This is where our nightmare began, in May of 2004. Riti here slipped on the wet floor, and we couldn't help her to stand up as she was in terrible pain. We sought immediate medical attention from the GP, X-rays and CT scans. The diagnosis was aggressive lung cancer, metastatic. Both our wills crumbled. How could that be? She was a non-smoker. A second opinion confirmed a worse diagnosis. Maybe she had four to six weeks. I loved her deeply, but it was time to shift to a different mode of quality care. I was a kaiafina with the Hekamaka Oranga Māori Health Services of Auckland District Health Board, and it was time to use those skills in my own home. Coordinating my whānau as kaitiaki wasn't always easy. We had whiteboard for medication charts, roster sheets for family members, four caregivers for each of the three shifts, nieces cooked, brothers greeted visitors, did karakia, my sons and two other nieces handled transportation and hospital visits. It was a beehive, but a beehive of love. Tears were banned in front of Ritihia or Mum. Ritihia ignored the six weeks to live and waited for our younger sister Anne's 50th birthday in October. Days later, she was admitted into hospital for the last time. The ward surged with family members, bidding her a final goodbye. Now she's returned to Waihapa, Pawaka Whakahua Urupa and rest there with her son John. She can fish any time now. Manaki played a really important role in the story as the kaitiaki. Mm. Tess, can you explain a little bit more about that kaitiaki role? Well, I think she did an amazing job of actually showing what happens when you bring the traditional knowledge within a whānau, with full whānau support and palliative healthcare literacy, because she is someone that has that particular body of knowledge, and she was able to introduce that into the whānau and awesome things happen when you bring those synergies together. And so you can certainly see with her playing this leadership role uh, to guide the Fano and to put everything in place. Everyone had a role to play. Everyone knew what their role was and everyone actually knew who the kaitiaki was, which was Manaki. So, you know, uh, 
she did incredibly well there and it just makes things run so smoothly and you can see the benefits across all aspects, physical, the medical situation, the environment, um, the whānau care that was provided was awesome. So what can health professionals learn from this story? Well I think what's critical here is that it demonstrates that whānau have all the skills needed to provide care. But actually, health literacy goes a long way. So providing information about the services that are available to help whānau provide care at the end of life, uh, information about the diagnosis, treatment options, and also the statutory entitlements, all of that stuff serves to empower whānau. And whānau want to care. But actually, sometimes, we just need that additional information and those resources to help us do the job really, really well. Mum pointed out the article and you laughed. I do not have motor neuron disease. Unfortunately, Mum was right. You were given six months to get your life into order. You asked me to tell your son, Robbie, of your terminal condition. I never told you how Robbie broke into a sweat. Red in the face as he asked, Why, Dad? How long does he have to live? When the neurologist asked about family history, why didn't we think of Nanny Collier on Mum's side? Remember the stories? Her hand shaking with Parkinson's, trying to steady her cup and saucer, while her mukapuna would laugh. Long tea or a short tea, Nan? Does not seem so funny now. You married young, but married right. Debbie loved you, and you were a wonderful dad to Jason and Robbie. And when little G was born, your eyes lit up. You couldn't speak, but you watched him like a hawk. Trust you to prepare for your tonguey. You wanted to lie next to dad, near our grandparents, in our whānau urupa so you wouldn't be lonely. You made sure you laid out your list. To be on our marae, no finger foods, to follow the kaupapa, right down to who would take turns to carry your coffin. What clothes to dress you in? Your mahogany coffin purchased online, laying in wait in the shed. What music to be played at the urupa? Bob Mali to the end, bro. Don't worry about a thing Cause every little thing is gonna be alright My dear sweet brother, it was a great send-off Every little thing was alright Kapai. What do you think is the most important message out of this story, Tess? Well, George certainly was an independent man, an independent thinker, surrounded by loving Fano. I think what the story shows us is the diversity of Māori. George actually, although he was unwell, he worked out exactly what he wanted to have happen for him at the end of his life, particularly around his tangiana. And so he went and organised getting his coffin and he told the whānau what he wanted to eat and what music he wanted and, you know, which, which um, uh, ancestral land he wanted to be taken to and 
all of that kind of thing, and who he wanted to lie, lie next to. And this really shows that he was loving his whānau. He was preparing them for his dying, and he was assisting them in planning and putting things in place, and I think that's uh, awesome. So what can health professionals learn from this story? I think health professionals can really uh, appreciate and understand that we are diverse. There are those amongst us who are very, very traditional. Uh, George's story really shows a wonderful uh, blending of the traditional and the contemporary because for a lot of our uh, Māori whānau, we don't have a need to organise our tangihana because we know it's going to be taken care of. Our tangi rituals have been there for hundreds of years. Nothing's changed. They're still the same. And here we have a young man that's actually able to make his own decisions and empower his whānau. And I think if health professionals really understand and appreciate that actually we come in all shapes and sizes, our whānau, and uh, we have the, fr the traditional and we also have the diverse, and just assist us and support us to achieve what we want at the end of our lives. My sister, baby Jeanette, had peaches and cream skin and blue eyes. She took after our Irish father, my mother said. But I knew her hair belonged to our mother, for it was jet black. She died before I was born in 1961. My mother told us how she would cradle baby Jeanette in her arms when she cried. She thought she was unsettled, but she was more than unsettled. She had a heart condition. My mother watched baby Jeanette take her last breath. Through my mother's eyes, I watched my tiny sister's wairua take flight, a soft pale leaf on the wind. The leaf cast a shadow over my mother, yet it didn't stop her loving others, including the young family she took into her Devonport home, giving John, Maud and their baby a roof over their heads. John's now an acclaimed artist with paintings and galleries across the world. Last week, my mother caught up with him and Maud for the first time in 56 years. He may not remember me, but remember he did. This lady took me and my wife and baby in when no one else would. She gave us the two front rooms and moved her family to the back of the house. He hugged her close. When I asked my mother if she was happy with John's gratitude, she snapped at me. But Tess, it's me who's grateful to them. John and Maud helped me when baby Jeanette died. They were so kind. A circle has closed. <laughs> Hine i whakai, whakametia mai, te whare tangata. Hine pūrotu, hine ngākou, hine rangi marie. Ko te whaia, ko te whaia. O te ao, o te ao.
So Tess, I'll let you speak to your story, but what would you say are some of the key messages from it? Kia ora Stella. I think that one of the main things that I tried to convey in this story about my mum losing her baby, my sister, was that loss and grief actually isn't something that is cast aside after a tangi or a funeral. Actually, I think it's something uh, that we experience throughout the lifespan and different things touch upon the memories and bring up those tears and um, and also we celebrate the tūpuna or the person that's died as well uh, throughout the lifespan. Um, and I think what the story conveys is that loss and grief recovery can come in all forms. In my mother's case, when the hospital rang to tell her that baby Jeanette was dying, she couldn't get to the hospital because the Harbour Bridge actually hadn't been built then. And so she relied on the lovely uh, family boarding in the front of her house, the Blackburns, to look after her. They spoke to her kindly, they listened to her, they made her lots of cups of teas, and in this way she was helped to make it to the morning and she was actually able to see her baby before she died. Now, all these years later, uh, my mother was able to celebrate the fact that she could reunite with her old friends and thank them and acknowledge them uh, for the love and the kindness they showed her because that has kept her company all through the years. And loss and grief transcends race, class, gender, ethnicity, sexuality. It doesn't cost anything to be kind.